Once again, it is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to The Truth in a Nutshell, our small contribution to the world of YouTube, where you give us 10 minutes, we give you the truth, and hopefully stir you to a closer and more profound walk with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, I am Michael Boldia, your humble host, and since wasting time is not among the things that we're known for, today we begin a new series that I've entitled The Vigilant Warrior. By the looks of it, uh, this will be a seven or eight part series, but if it needs to be longer, then it will be, because given the times that we're living in, uh, this is an important and timely topic. Men wage war for various reasons at various times. While some are compelled by patriotism or religious beliefs, others still are driven by ambition or lust for power. Whatever the underlying reason for war, it is powerful enough to cause an individual to risk their life for it. In any battle, in any war, the possible loss of one's life is implied. There has never been a war waged without casualties, and every individual who enlists does so with the full knowledge that it may very well mean their life. Physical war is bloody, it is brutal, and it is taxing in every way possible. What believers seem to have forgotten over the years is that spiritual warfare is just as brutal, just as taxing, and just as ruthless as any war in the physical. Spiritual warfare also carries greater far-reaching consequences than war in the natural does, because the consequences of spiritual warfare are eternal in their scope. Whatever, wherever I happen to be on any given Sunday, it seems I hear more about the victory party after the war than I do about the war itself anymore. Preachers don't like to preach on spiritual warfare. Parishioners don't like to hear about spiritual warfare. And so we focus on the hereafter, on the moment beyond time when the last sword has been swung and the last blow has been struck, utterly failing to prepare or even make the individual aware of the war that they're currently embroiled in. I'm going to keep it simple. If you call yourself a son or a daughter of God, then you are at war. Since the fact that you are already at war is a foregone reality and you have no say in the matter, would it not be wise and prudent to learn all you can about your enemy and about the weapons you have at your disposal? Would it not be wisdom itself to learn how we can defend ourselves and even go on the offensive against an enemy who has already made it perfectly clear that he will take no prisoners? Even though the spectator stands are overflowing and the warriors on the field of battle are decreasing in number at an alarming rate, we who remain cannot give up the fight. We cannot lay down our arms, we cannot take off our armor, we cannot surrender to the enemy. For if we do, we will be counted among the rebellious and the disobedient, those who ought to have known what it is to stand, to fight, to overcome an enemy who fears our general and who has given us the privilege and right to walk in his authority. Revelation 12, 10 and 11 say it this way, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death. Now, we hear these words, and somehow they sound hollow to our ears. We hear these words and do not see ourselves in the role of those who did not love their lives to the death, those who overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the power of their testimony. We always think that it's referring to another, to someone else to a different group of believers, a different generation, or a different continent, perhaps. We cannot fail to see the simple profundity of these verses. 
the only means by which this group of overcomers was identified is that they were brethren and they knew the weapons of their warfare. They knew the power of the blood of the Lamb. And they, to the last, forfeited their lives for the great high calling of being a follower of Jesus. If battle finds us unprepared, if the enemy finds us defenseless, if we find ourselves standing on the battlefield with no weapons of either defense or offense, know that our ill-preparedness was not God's fault, but our own. We have been warned, repeatedly. So, to prepare to put on our armor, to know how to wield the power granted to us by the blood of the Lamb. And if we have failed to do these things, or believe that they somehow did not pertain to us, we have no one to blame but ourselves. Ephesians 6, 10-13 says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Battle presupposes many things. But certain ones are essential. Among the essentials of any conflict are armies, arms, tactics, strategy, and the knowledge of one's enemies. If any of these essentials is missing, one's loss of the battle is ensured even before the first blow is struck. Without having the right soldiers, the right arms, the right strategy, and a fundamental understanding of one's enemy, one is inhibited and stunted in their ability to fight the fight in such a manner that their victory is certain. Brutal and cold-hearted as it may seem, one need give only a passing glance to the current church to, to realize that though we might call ourselves an army, most of us are in fact weaponless, absent of strategy, ignorant of tactics, and woefully unaware of our enemy what he can do, and the lengths to which he will go in any conflict. A soldier's ignorance of his weapons on the battlefield will almost always ensure his demise. If he stands face to face against his enemy and does not know how to wield his sword, raise his shield, or have a passing knowledge of all the weapons in his arsenal, that moment of hesitation that fumbling with one's scabbard, the overreach of one's sword, the wrong placement of one's shield, and the enemy will strike the mortal blow. By the same token, a soldier who does not know the tactics of his enemy or know how to defend against them is at a serious disadvantage on the battlefield as well. We are warned and forthrightly. So in God's word, it tells us not to be ignorant of the devil's devices. The reason this warning is found within the pages of Scripture is because once we're aware of the devil's devices, we will naturally begin to take steps to protect ourselves against them and guard our hearts against their influences. Now, this series will explore the enemy's devices, but also the need to be self-aware and to know the most vulnerable areas that the enemy might strike, and build up the defenses there. I will be frank with you, as I always am. I will be honest, as I always strive to be. And above all, I will be scriptural in my approach of this very sensitive topic. Because if we're not biblically sound, everything we say is irrelevant anyway. With that, it seems that our time for today is at an end. Please join us next week as we continue our discussion of the vigilant warrior and how you too can become one. Until next time, this has been The Truth in a Nutshell. May God bless you.